The text that I'm going to be jumping off from is John chapter 3, verse 21. John chapter 3, verse 21. The subject that I have been given is the Calvinism of Jesus. The Calvinism of Jesus. And my proposition is this. This is what I aim to prove to you today. Is that regeneration precedes faith. Ladies and gentlemen, Calvinism is simple. 1 John chapter 6 verse 16 tells us that God dwells in unapproachable light. This speaking of the triunity of God. And if you was to ask me to explain to you or to show you how Jesus is God, this text is where I will take you. That God dwells in unapproachable light. Jesus tells us in John 6, 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through him. He is the way to the Father. He is the truth. What you believe about Jesus matters. And in him is life. He is the only way to the Father. Jesus also says in John 6, 44, that no one can come to him unless the Father draws him. If God dwells in unapproachable light, and we cannot get to the Father outside of Jesus, but we cannot get to Jesus unless we're drawn by the Father, how do we get to God? And the answer is found in John 6, 37. Jesus speaking all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. To my non-Calvinist friends who are in your day, I want you to know that I came to Christ. I came to Christ. Amen. Everyone who is in Christ has come to Jesus. Amen. However, our coming to Jesus relies upon our being given to Jesus by the Father. The Father has not given you to the Son. Ladies and gentlemen, you will not give it to Jesus. I also want to make mention that Calvinism doesn't teach that there are people who want to be in Christ, but cannot be in Christ. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Let's read this text that I'm going to leap from. We'll read it and then we'll come back to it later. John chapter 3, verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God or by God in the common translation. Amen. The question is, is what is that work? What is that work that has been carried out in or by God? What I aim to show today is that faith is the work carried out in or by God. The faith that saves is not an experiential faith, meaning it's not a learned faith. The faith that saves is a gift given to us by God. For someone to believe that they in and of themselves or with the help of the Holy Spirit have the ability to conquer up this faith is wrong. And it shows their lack of understanding concerning faith. Amen. Jesus, in his conversation with Nicodemus, disregards his first birth as concerning the kingdom of God. And he does so by pointing to him a greater birth. A birth from above. And I plan to show this by asking three questions. First question. How is a person saved? Second question. What is is faith. Third question. What is regeneration? 
How is a person saved? What is faith? And what is regeneration? And as we transition, Calvinism stands or falls on three simple words. Regeneration precedes faith. If that is untrue, then Calvinism is false. And Calvinism falls on its sword. It's like the, the old Japanese samurai warrior who when knows that he's been defeated pulls out his smaller sword and falls upon it. Ladies and gentlemen, if what I'm presenting to you today is false, every one of us who has spoken falls on the sword. First question. How is a person saved? A person is saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And by that I'm speaking about his active and passive obedience. The act of obedience of Jesus living the life that we could not live. Him keeping the covenant. Him keeping the law as Braden pointed out to us earlier. That there is a covenant of works by which you and I are doomed. Amen. Because we could not keep it. The act of obedience of Christ by which we are saved is Him keeping that law. Thank you, Lord. Who in here grew up in public school like myself? Then you should understand what I'm about to tell you. When your teacher was unable to come to school, whether she was sick or on vacation, they sent a teacher to teach in her place, and that teacher was called a substitute. That teacher taught in the place of your teacher. The passive obedience of Jesus Christ comes because you and I have broken God's law. Every one of us are liars and thieves and adulterers who were not obedient to our parents. We see people with possession and we want it so bad we wish that they did not own them and we did. Amen. We were not obedient to our parents. Needless to say, and we do not love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. The passive obedience is Christ taking our place. It's his active obedience. He did love God. His Father, with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, and with all of his strength, and his neighbor and his himself. And because we could not, he had to become our substitute. And in his passive obedience, is sacrifice in our place. Yes. You and I deserve the full wrath of God. As Jesus was on that cross, the mercy of God and the wrath of God met. Amen. And the mercy that Jesus deserved because he kept the law comes to us. And the wrath that we deserve for breaking that law fell on him. If a person is saved, they're saved because of what was done for them in Christ, in God. My dear brother Braden was speaking to you earlier about the covenants. I too am speaking to you in covenant language. I hold to what's called the covenant of redemption, the triune covenant that God made between the Trinity. That God the Father purposed to save the people. And in doing so, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, Amen. to accomplish that purpose through his life, death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. Thank you, Lord. And the Holy Spirit applies the purpose to the message of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, salvation means to be saved, and to be saved means to be rescued. Yes. I want you to picture a house on fire. I want you to imagine that there's people inside this house. And if they're not rescued, they're going to die by the flame. I want you to imagine the first responders pull up. 
police officers, paramedics, and firefighters. And the police officer gets on his, I guess they still call it a bullhorn, I'm not sure. And he says to the people who are in the flame, attention, the first responders are out here. Now we need you to exit the house and lie down on the gurney. And we will put you in the ambulance and take you to receive medical aid. So that the firefighters can put out the fire. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the best friends with a firefighter. And let me tell you what Braden did. He was kicking the door and removing the flame. Salvation is the firefighter kicking in the door and removing you from the flame. Salvation is God the Father sending God the Son as our substitute. First John tells us that Jesus is our propitiation. That Jesus is our payment for wrongdoing. That's what it means in layman's terms. Right? It's to appease, appease something that you owe. It's a payment for wrongdoing. Now my daughter's here. She hates when I give this analogy. <laughs> but my daughter, a year or two ago, got a soccer ball in a net. And if she was able to, if she had the ability, her leg power was strong enough to kick that soccer ball and mess the net, and bust out my neighbor's window. <laughs> she would owe a debt that she could not pay. She just turned 13. I won't be able to use this analogy when she gets a job. <laughs> but I have a lot more kids. <laughs> pass it down. <laughs> I don't know how much a window costs these days, nor how much it would be to hire someone to put it in. But it's a payment that she cannot pay. And so me being daddy has to reach into my pocket and pull out the propitiation, the payment for her wrongdoing. We broke God's law. God has paid our fine. And he has paid our fine by sending Jesus Christ as the payment for our wrongdoing. Second question. What is faith? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Faith is the act of trusting in what we know to be true. Every one of us uses the act of faith. The act of trusting in what we know to be true. This is what I was talking about earlier about a learned faith. Imagine with me you're learning to drive a car. When you get into your vehicle, when you're driving your car, how do you know that when you hit the brakes, your vehicle is going to come to a complete stop? Let me tell you how you know. Because you grew up being driven around and with your eyes, you saw that when your mom or dad or grandmother or step-parents, whoever it was that raised you, was coming to a red light stop sign or wherever it may be, when they hit the brakes, the vehicle came to a stop. And so you know by learned faith, something that you've experienced, that when you're driving, when you come to a red light, a stop sign or wherever it may be, when you ease in on the brakes, you're going to come to a complete stop. Now, there's many examples that I can give you about experienced faith. But the faith that it takes to be saved is not something we have experienced. It's not something we learn in order to have. Saving faith is not logical. It's logical to believe that there's a God. 
Creation declares the glory of God. All right? In the same way that this building that we're in is evidence of the builder, creation gives to us evidence that there is a God. It's logical to believe that there is a God. Amen. However, it is not logical to believe that God entered into time, became flesh to accomplish the purpose of redemption, that is to save a people. The faith that it takes to be saved is theological. It's believing in something we did not see but know to be true. In order to be saved, one must believe that God the Father sent to us His Son. We must believe in the incarnation, life, death, burial, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Amen. We must believe that the second person of the Trinity entered into time, the Creator entered into to creation, the infinite became finite. We must believe that He lived the life that you and I could not live, and in His death He took the punishment that we deserve, that He was buried, and on the third day He rose again. And then over 40 days later, he ascended into heaven to be with the Father. And he sits at the right hand of the throne. And he's ruling and reigning. He's putting all of his enemies under his feet. And I know this because I was an enemy. You were an enemy in here in Christ. And you, just like me, have been put school. You and I haven't experienced any of those things I just mentioned of what it takes to be saved. Imagine with me, if you will, that resurrection was something that we experienced. Out of those several things that I named, resurrection seemed to be the most plausible because they're all kind of like low outrageous, right? If we're honest. Imagine that. Imagine if one of our friends were to die. And you came and said, man, I can't believe Bob died yesterday. I said, oh, brother, he'll be back in two days. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you believe that, you have an oceanfront property in Arizona. <laughs> that is the most logical out of everything that I just came about. premise of logic alone. If being saved by Jesus requires a response such as repentance and faith, meaning to turn from logical thinking on our own to God, then we cannot respond in repentance and faith. We cannot because that message is foolishness. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll read verse 18 yeah. to verse 23. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Before Christ were we perishing? The word of the cross is foolish. It's folly. But to us who are being saved, Speaking of our, those who are saved and are experienced sanctification, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, and I will, I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom? The world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and falling to the Gentiles. 
and speaking with atheists who are Darwinian evolutionists, we have to show them that their beliefs are non-scientific, not logical. In order for something to be scientific, it would have to be proven by observation. They cannot go back billions of years to prove evolution, and you and I do not have a time machine to travel back in the first century to the time of Christ, nor do we have the ability to peek behind the curtain to see Christ prior to his incarnation. We cannot prove by observation Christianity. It's not logical. Christianity has to do with theology, God's word. Is this God's word? Yes. Amen. Amen. That's where Christianity comes from. On the theory of libertarian free will, if being saved by Jesus requires a response such as repentance and faith, meaning to turn from being dead in our sins to being in life in Christ, then we cannot respond in repentance and faith. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Thank you, Lord. Our deadness has to do with our following the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. That is the devil. Jesus in John 8 makes a declaration which I think is one of the clearest parts in scripture pointing himself to be God. At this time in John 8, and partially in, they're, they're celebrating what's called the Feast of Booths. And I believe that as they're taking down what seem to be these large torches, these menorahs, right? These, that has this fire. They would light these huge candles that would light up most Jerusalem. If you were able to fly over by plane at that time and see this, it would probably be the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And as I believe that as they're taking down these torches, these menorahs, these, these huge lights, they would light these lights to remember their, uh, the time in the, in the wilderness as their fathers were, were following the bright cloud by day and the fire by night. And it was a way to remember what happened in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, that cloud, that fire, was a representation of God. And as they're taking these lights down, after they had this, this glorious time together, Jesus says in verse 12, I am the light of the world, that whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, it was told that as that cloud by day or that fire by night began to move, they would have to move with it. What would happen at that time during, in the wilderness if that cloud by day or that fire by night was to move and you stood still? You would be in darkness. Jesus proclaiming himself to be God, saying, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Those that are following the devil are walking in darkness. Darkness. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul reveals to us how a person is made alive in Christ. Paul tells us it is by God granting repentance. Listen, repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. If you do not repent, you cannot have faith. And if you say you have faith without repentance, you are a liar. Yeah. Repentance here leads to the knowledge of truth. But you may ask, why does God need to grant repentance? The answer is, is because we were in the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. We're following after the devil. We're in his trap. We need to be made alive. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to read verse 24 through 26. Now in this, I want to give a little bit of context. He's speaking to a worker who is approved by God. He's speaking to those that go out and they do the heavy lifting in evangelism. He says, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Church, we got a lot to learn from this, this verse. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. Oh, Calvinists, we got a lot to learn. Amen. God may perhaps grant them repentance, grant them repentance, grant them repentance. My broken record. Grant them repentance, <laughs> leading to a knowledge of truth. And they may come to their own senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. To be dead in sins is explained to us here. To be dead in sins is to be captured by the devil to do his will. This means to be dead in sins and to be saved is to be made alive. In Christ to be made alive in Christ. My kids do not clean their rooms unless I make them. Do your kids? Because I tell you what, if you know something I don't, whether you're a non Calvinist or a Calvinist, please let me know because mine won't. I'm talking especially to my daughters when I'm coming and I'm lifting the legs as high as I can to step over so. She will not clean her room unless daddy says clean your room. And if I just say it lightly, she doesn't pay attention. I have to give her the daddy eyes and lower the voice and grit the teeth. Clean your room. What's your problem? I have to make her. It's true. Now, what we experience in our being rescued is our believing. If I was to tell you my testimony and how I came to Christ, it would be a whole bunch of what, of what I did, right? ex gang banging pimp. Just being honest. Nine eleven happened. The tap planes flew into the tower. Someone said, this is in the Bible. I got kicked out of school at the age of 15 for gang violence. I never did schoolwork. Never in my life did homework. I struggled with dyslexia. Couldn't read a wick. I picked up a Bible that day. Read Read three or four, skip ten words. Read three or four words and skip ten. But every day I picked up that Bible and started reading. For too long I could read four and skip nine. Read five and skip eight. I learned how to read by reading the Bible. Amen. 
In 2005, I heard Ray Comfort preaching in the open air. I saw myself naked before the Lord, knowing, knowing that I needed to be clothed in righteousness. Amen. And he only provided one garment, and it was Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So I repented, and I believed. I came to Christ. Amen. Third question. What is regeneration? Regeneration is, listen, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist spoke about this. He said, I see you Pharisees and you Sadducees coming down to the waters of Jordan, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Do not say, therefore, we have Abraham as our father, for God is able to raise up children of Abraham from stones. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the stones. Amen. Us Gentiles. He spoke about three baptisms there. One of them was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's regeneration. Amen. Regeneration, which takes place through the hearing of the gospel. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says this. So faith comes from hearing. Comes from hearing. Faith comes from from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, the gospel. Amen. You can't not have faith and not know the gospel. You need to hear and to know the gospel in order to have faith. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 2. This is Paul asking a rhetorical question. He says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing in faith? Well, how do we get the faith? By hearing the message of Christ. How do we get the Holy Spirit? By hearing in faith. It's simple. Faith is given to us through hearing the message about Christ. Someone proclaiming to you the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit applying to you the purpose. Remember God's purpose to save a people. In time, he sent his son to accomplish the purpose through his life, death, burial, resurrection. When we preach this message, the Holy Spirit applies the purpose. The Holy Spirit is given to us not by works of the law, but by hearing in faith. The message of Jesus Christ must be preached in order for someone to have faith. And faith comes, listen, before the Holy Spirit. And to my Calvinist friends, I hope your non-Calvinist friends know that you believe that. Because what I see online doesn't reflect that. Since getting back into the ministry, I've noticed that when it comes to theology, it is like driving down a one-way road highway. It's snowing. There is no street lights. The lights on my car are no longer working. It's a curvy road. And I'm doing my best to keep the vehicle on the road. There's always two ditches that you can fall in. With any theology in the Christian faith, you're on the road. And if you gear from one side to the other, you are in heresy. If not heresy, then orthodox, and then ortho, wherever that word is, I can't even think of it right now. <laughs> so I should write everything I say, right? It's not orthodoxy. In order to stay on the road of orthodoxy, we have to have speed, we have to have things keeping us on the road, such as if you're going bowling, right? If I take my children bowling, I want to bow with them because they have the little blow of things, and I can always knock my pins down. <laughs> there is no gutter balls. As we're studying these scriptures, 
We need something to keep us on the road. And that's why us who hold to Orthodox Christianity, we use the creeds and we use the confessions as we're studying. And I mentioned this yesterday during the Q&A. My foundation of understanding the Bible is covenant theology. And I gave the little example like, like, uh, uh, about a cup, but let's say the phone. If I let my hands go, what happens to the phone? It falls. Now, if I let my hand go, what happens to the phone? It stays in its place. Without a foundation upon which you read the Bible, you're going to go off into a ditch. Amen. In order to have the Holy Spirit, one must respond in faith when they hear the gospel. Amen. And as someone who does the work of an evangelist, I can tell you that most people walk away from the message that is preached without being given the gift of faith. Turn with me to Ephesians 2 again. Look at verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved. Rescued. For by grace you have been rescued. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. What's not of my own doing? What's the nearest end of the city? Faith. Faith is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Amen. You get it by hearing. Amen. Those two verses alone should take away any notion that we have that in and of ourselves we have the ability to believe. We do respond, just not in faith. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3. So we can see this word regeneration. Titus chapter 3, let's read verses 4 and 5. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared... He saved us, not by works done in righteousness, law keeping, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. My dear friends, mercy is God not giving to us what we deserve, and what we deserve is the wrath of God. Amen. Amen. We broke God's law. We committed treason against the king. We deserve punishment. And if you think that you don't, maybe you haven't even been given the gift of faith. Amen. Turn with me to John 3. We'll just be here for a moment and we'll go somewhere else again. But I promise we'll get to that verse. And as we walk through this, I want to show how Jesus will take the earthly to explain the heavenly. In verses 1 through 5, we're going to see natural birth versus spiritual birth. The Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. The Old Covenant. The Old Covenant had an earthly kingdom people, the physical descendants of Abraham. Entrance into the old covenant, earthly people was by natural birth. When a Jewish family had a child, that child entered into the old covenant, kingdom people. The new covenant, the new covenant has a heavenly kingdom people, the spiritual descendants of Abraham, Galatians chapter 3. 
entrance into the new covenant heavenly kingdom people is spiritual birth. This baptism of the Holy Spirit. You must be born again. Nicodemus entered the old covenant earthly kingdom people, the physical descendants of Abraham, by natural birth. You and I are to enter the new covenant kingdom people by spiritual birth. Let's read John chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. Now there was a man of the Pharisees, excuse me. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is with your eyes. You do not even know that God has a kingdom unless you're born again. You have no clue. You're following the, the spirit that is at work and the sons of disobedience. You're following the devil because you're trapped in his snare. Amen. You don't even know. You can't see it unless you're born again. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're born again, you cannot see. And unless you're born again, you cannot enter. And I would say that you and I enter this kingdom by faith. We enter the kingdom by faith. The new birth, right? By faith. And we're going to see how that works out. The water here in verse 5 is the same water in Titus chapter 3 verse 5 and that is how we are saved Titus 3 again verses 4 through 5 but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appear when did God our Savior appear 2,000 years ago oh, that's right he appeared in the incarnation lived the life that we could not live took upon himself the punishment that we deserve. He was buried and rose again on the third day. When he appeared, he saved us. He rescued us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, in law keeping, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Mercy is God not giving to us what we deserve. Jesus in John here is pointing us to Ezekiel chapter 36. This is why we see him be so harsh with Nicodemus. Him being a teacher of the law. And you don't know this? Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. What saddens me is to know that there's people who think that this is something future. But I don't know what they do with X2. In Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 25 through 27, we will see what regeneration looks like. Let's read Ezekiel 36. 25 through 27. God speaking. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart 
and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Ladies and gentlemen, I just read to you the biblical auto salutis, the order of salvation, which consists of three inseparable things that work in unison. And that is grace, faith, and the Holy Spirit. Grace is God given to us what we don't deserve. And in verse 25, it's being made clean. Forgiving us of our sins. Look again at verse 25. I, the Lord says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. Clean from what? From all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Thank you, Lord. How does he do that? In his active and passive obedience. This is the kind of washing that David was speaking about in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 2. He says, have mercy on me. He said, do not give me what I deserve, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. He had just committed adultery, slept with a man's wife. That deserves to be, a man that does that deserves to be stoned. And then... He gets her pregnant and has her husband murdered. Again, another punishment that's deserving of death. He says, God, do not give me what I deserve. What did he deserve? Death. He deserved to die. Have mercy on me. In verses 26 through 27 of Ezekiel, God reveals to us how we are given faith and the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 26. We're just going to read a partial piece of this verse. Verse 26. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. So in his grace, we are forgiven through the act of impassive obedience of Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace. And also in this regeneration, he's going to give us a new heart and a new spirit. The new heart here, I believe, is faith, and the new spirit is the Holy Spirit. Now let's see how he does this. Let's finish reading verse 26. I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I take the position that the heart of the, excuse me, I take the position that the heart of stone is self-righteousness, which operates in the manner of trying to please God by our own merit. Now since I was, through Ray Comfort's ministry, given the gift of faith, I use his style of witnessing, which if you know anything about church history, it did not come from my comfort. <laughs> the, the three uses of the law, the first use of the law is that we use the law as a mirror. We use the law to show people that they have sinned against God. They committed treason against God. And we can also use it to ourselves to see that <laughs> I still need him. Right. And I've asked many of people, are you a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. And we use the law to show them that they're not. Us trusting in our own good works and not trusting in God. Ladies and gentlemen, 90% of the Christians that I meet would say they're a good person. 
they're not trusting in God. They're trusting in their own good works. While the heart of flesh is faith. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. How are we justified? By faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is coming off the hills of chapter 4. Speaking about the faith of Abraham, how Abraham was justified by believing God. You and I are justified by believing what God has done for us in Christ. Just like Abraham, in order for Christianity to be true, Christianity has to be owed. The same way that Abraham is saved is the same way that you and I are saved. By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This right here is telling us that there's a time you and I were at war with God. It was us versus God. And the terms of peace is faith. And Christians are called to be God's delegates. To go out, proclaim the gospel, and to tell people they are at war with God. And the only way to have peace with this God is to have faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. The Bible talks about Jesus being... Uh, 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 that what he did in his life, death, burial, and resurrection was the righteous for the unrighteous. The law keeper for the law breakers. The one who loved God and neighbor for the one who did not love God or neighbor. And the only way to have peace with God by what Jesus Christ has done is to be justified by faith. This is what King David was asking for in Psalm 51, verse 10. He says, Create in me a clean heart. O God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. And what is given to us in faith? The Holy Spirit. Look at verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you. And calls you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my voice. <coughs> in his grace we are made clean. We are given a new heart of faith. And the Holy Spirit. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing in faith? It's hearing in faith. <laughs> if you have the Holy Spirit, you have it by hearing in faith. Amen. According to verse 27, the work, of the, I mean, the, the work of the Holy Spirit is to cause us to keep God's commands. To love God, how? By believing in the name of the Son, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. And to love our neighbors as ourselves. Question. What was the law of God written on in the New Covenant? Answer. According to Hebrews 8, it's the heart. Braden beautifully explained to us what the law of God was written on in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And as the hand of God was writing those ten words. Sorry. I studied Judaism, the Jewish tradition for three years. The Ten Commandments are called the Ten Words. He was rewriting those ten words on those, that same hand. That same hand! The same hand! And you're born again. God is writing on our heart. Those ten words. And the Holy Spirit that's in us causes us to obey. Amen. You do nothing. When you screw up, that's you. When you're obedient, that's God within you. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10 shows us how the heart and belief are woven together. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, believe where? Is, is it in my mind? Not all oaths in my heart. And believe in your heart 
that God raised him from the dead. Well, that's not logical. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We have a ton of people who do not believe in the perseverance of the saints because of what they see with their eyes. People who profess faith in Jesus Christ and live like the devil. And they live like the devil because that's who they're following. Did you know that you can confess with your mouth and not believe in your heart? It takes both. Many of people have prayed the prayer, walked an aisle, shook a hand, signed a card, without truly believing something that's not logical. That God raised Jesus from the dead. If you do not believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, you are not saved. Amen. Regeneration is the baptism from which grace, faith, and the Holy Spirit is given to us. We enter the new covenant, the heavenly kingdom, spiritual descendants of Abraham, by the faith of Abraham, which is given to us in the washing of regeneration. Now let's go back to John chapter 3 for our remaining time. If this isn't clear to you, then this message can never be clear. Look at verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. O covenant kingdom people. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. New covenant, heavenly kingdom people. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Meaning, your entrance into the old covenant, not good enough. The wind blows where it wishes. So right here, the wind, so we have the flesh pointing to the earth, earthly things. The wind also is pointing to the earthly things. The wind blows where it wishes. Jesus always uses what, the things that we are observant of to explain to us the heavenly. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, and you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Here's the heavenly. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Now here's that rebuke I was talking about earlier. Jesus answered, are you a teacher of Israel? Meaning he should know the Bible. He should have the, the whole Bible memorized and also the 300 and something prophecies of the coming Messiah. Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. Right here, he's letting them know that I'm speaking to you in an earthly way to explain to you the heavenly. And we bear witness of what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe... How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one, so right here is going to be speaking about him being God. No one has ascended into heaven except for he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. He's pointing to something earthly. What took place during the time of the wilderness where they grumbled about the food given to them by God. Grumbling and speaking bad about God and Moses. God sends serpents, sends snake, representative of the enemy to come and bite them, to kill them. They realize their faults. They call to Moses they didn't call to God. They called to Moses and asked Moses to pray for them. 
that God would get rid of these serpents. God tells Moses to make a bronze serpent and to hang it on a pole. And that whoever looks with your eyes, whoever sees this snake, this bronze snake on the pole, will be saved. Their life will be spared. They'll be healed. He's going back to the earthly just like that. If you will look to me on that cross, you too may have eternal life for God. This is this right here. God here, Greek word Theo, is pointing us to the Father. So loved the world, cosmos, not oikomene, not just the, the small piece of land by the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. So loved the world. For God so loved the, the world, all of earth, that he gave to us his Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you see the substitutionary atonement? Yes. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Because we're already condemned. Amen. But in order, that, in order that the world might be saved through him. You want to hear total depravity? Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. They're following the serpent. Because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world. And people love darkness rather than light. Because their works were evil. They were trapped by the serpent. Their works were evil. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. What is the work carried out in God? What work in this area have we been told to do? Believe. Believe. Faith. Your belief, you're believing, you're looking to the Son, you're, you're believing that, that God sent his Son is the work of God. It is carried out in God or by God. It's our being justified, being made right with God. Look at verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains upon him. How are we to obey God? Answer, believing. We're told nothing else. Believing. It's the work of God. Outside of the washing of regeneration, we cannot be saved, and that is the Calvinism of Jesus. If the purpose of God isn't applied to us and the message preached about Christ, the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, we cannot be saved. We cannot get to God because He dwells in unapproachable light. In the same way that that door needs hinges in order to open and shut, you and I have to be given to the Son by the Father. Our being given to the Son is the hinges upon which we are able to come to Jesus. It's that simple. Regeneration precedes faith in the fact that faith is given to us in the washing of regeneration. Let's pray. Oh God, Lord, you are glorious. And Lord, we stand in awe of what you have done for us in the active and passive obedience of Jesus Christ. Lord, even as Christians, we are not actively obedient. We have our ups and our downs. Well, Lord, we know through the sanctifying power that through what you have done for us and are doing for us, we will one day be glorified. Yes. Because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. And that image is speaking about glorification, Lord. For those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. 
That day at the resurrection when we are raised from the ground, Lord, the sheep separated from the ghosts, there's going to be some clothed in the man of heaven, those whom you foreknown before the foundation of the world, and those whom you did not will be clothed in the man of dust, still carrying the curse of Adam. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing in Tallahoma. And Lord, we pray that you will use every one of us to preach your gospel in such a way that you will apply the purpose. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.